You're watching The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Nipsey Hussle. What up, what up, what up? What's Nip, up, what's up, my brother? What's the deal, bro? Now, I don't know nothing about L.A. politics, but are you allowed to wear that much red? I can do what I want, man. <laughs> this is my shit. This is my brand. So okay. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, I like how red look with gold. You know what I mean? Do people trip like that with the colors you wear? or, or? It depends. Like, again, I'm, everybody know who I am as far as where I belong. So, you know, I be seeing, like, internet uh, comments sometimes when I be flamed up. But in L.A., you know what I mean? We grew up. If you was a real one, you could wear what you want. That mm -hmm. shit don't really apply. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, is, is, is it still heavy like that though? I mean, it's it's like if I'm in somebody else's hood with a gang of red on, and I'm I'm not a known face, and I'm in a crib hood, yeah, it'll probably I probably get addressed. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I had that problem. They be like, that's nip, you know what I'm saying? Well, now, congratulations seen... on the album. I got Find me, man. Yeah, yeah, find me. Victory find lap. <laughs> yeah, victory lap in stores. Go grab that, stream that, all that. You don't even see to prove victory lap, man. I, I had to. It took too long, right? You had a lot to prove on that. Yeah, album. I did. <laughs> Let's talk about it now. The album is dope, first and foremost. Thank you. I love the album. Thank um, you. Heard it on the West Coast when I was there for All Star Weekend. It's only right. And then I heard it here. It didn't sound the same. The snow didn't make me feel West Coast when I when <laughs> right. I got back home. Right. But um, seems like on the album you, you you really proving that you know I hear a lot that you don't like weirdo rappers. <laughs> Facts. You don't like weirdo. Now what's a weirdo rapper to you? Well, I, I think you talking about the line when I was like, "This ain't this weirdo rap you motherfuckers mm -hmm. used, used to." to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just feel like you know um, I felt pressure a little bit from where the game is at and there ain't no diss to nobody specific just like mm -hmm. it ain't it ain't um in the direction of what we grew up on in terms of like you gotta say something you know what i mean you gotta be a man of respect or a woman of respect mm -hmm. you know what i mean even from like just the drug stuff like you know that was never glorified in, in, in rap culture we could almost like live by scarface or jay-z or tupac lyrics if we ain't had no principles like a man around we could live by their lyrics and come out as a solid individual so that's what i meant just as far as like you know just returning to that direction i don't know like telling people what to do but just you know try to represent the principles that, that i grew up on in rap music that, that, that's one thing i like about your music it always has socially redeeming value to it and on, on dedication you know kendrick said that his man l said do a song with nip he a better crip, but Kendrick said he a man first. Yeah. You know, you hear what he speaks about from black businesses yeah, to false yeah. imprisonments. And he said, listen, close is bigger than deuces and four. So is that a challenge for you to get people to see you for more than a stereotypical West Coast gangster rapper? I think that, I mean, people people receive me based on what I said. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't blame people for that. I came in and said, this is where I'm from and this is mm -hmm. what I represent. Mm -hmm. But it was for a reason. I wanted, I wanted to establish, you know, what I belong to. And I looked at it like jail. That's what I used to tell my homies because even some of my homeboys would be like, bro, you can't come out talking about the hood specifically, you know what I mean? But I'm just like, you know, um, when you walk into a dorm, the first thing you establish is where you from. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you get into the, the person behind this, just in case whoever got a problem with this, wherever your enemies is, you go to the back, you handle your business, and then you get into like, okay, I could actually fuck with you, you, you know what I mean? We get to know each other, but you get that out the way first. And so, um, also I wanted to, I wanted my message to impact gang culture. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I wanted what I had to say to impact individuals like myself, young people that was in these areas that was controlled by gang banging. I didn't want to preach to the choir, but mm. I wanted to be able to say, you know, uh, I'm one of you, and where I'm gonna go, wherever I end up, you're gonna you're gonna know that you can end up there too. Whether it's at the top of the game or in a successful situation as a business owner. I came from this and it's it's authentic and I'm not on the outside of this culture. That's why I came in like I came in. I wasn't trying to like be on no super tough guy shit. You know what I'm saying? I just wanted to be clear that, you know, wherever I take it, I'm not I'm not different. I'm I'm exactly the same. I've been through everything you've been through or you're gonna go through as a somebody in that culture. What and is that, a what is a better crip? What does that mean? I think I think what Kendrick I don't know because I ain't said, but okay. what I would assume Kendrick meant was that um, you know, somebody that is not 100% um, biased or outside of communicating with a blood or somebody from the other right. side of the mm -hmm. tracks. Maybe that's what he meant, that's what I took it as, you know? But I, we had to ask Kendrick his, 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 
take on what he meant by that. Right. What that I've always appreciated about you is that you've always been an entrepreneur, and it does come through a lot on this album also. Just right. a lot of things you've done, having your own clothing line, having your own agency, and then your whole thing with the cryptocurrency that right. I was reading about that right. you've invested in, and you want other people to be able to invest as well. Yeah. You know, and I think that's important because when I first met you, I always say this, you were really like at music industry seminars and yeah, summits yeah, yeah. and making sure you knew the business because you've been independent for so long. Yeah. So it makes it time to step when you do a major label deal with Atlantic Records and you know exactly what's going on with your business. And that's so important, something that a lot of people need to focus on. What made you go yeah, back to the label, yeah. though? You know, because she mentioned that and. You know, when, when I was at Def Jam, we were trying to get you to stay at Def Jam, and you wanted out. You, you like, was you, I was at Epic. I was at, at Epic. Epic. That's yeah, right, yeah. when I was at Epic. Yeah. Yeah, that, and you wanted out. Like, yeah. and we were trying to get you to stay. Like, what made you have that vision so early? Because when you were signed, this is when Independent was looked down upon. Absolutely. So what made you see that vision, and then what made you go back to the label side? I mean, honestly, coming into rap, I tell I told this story before. I had a, and I we had, tried to sign you at Def Jam. That's what it was. We yeah, yeah, yeah. Def Jam. yeah. Go ahead. Yep, exactly. When Khaled was over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, like before rap, I mean, before I got into whatever the industry is or into a label situation, my goal as a hustler was to sell 50,000 units and to get 15,000 a show because I read somewhere that Joel Santana got 15,000 a show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, damn, that's cool. We, we do a lot for 15,000. Mm -hmm. And then um, to be able to sell 50,000 indie because I was like, I watched Master P, I studied P, I studied like the independent successes what J and them did before they deal. And I'm like, that's that's um, impressive mm -hmm. as an indie. If you could if you could do that, then you can leverage a different type of negotiation when you go to the label. So I always wanted to go in that direction. When I did my epic deal, you know, I was on the run. When I had a case pending, my my crime was in jail. I thought I was about to go do a lot of time, and I hid out. I went to my homeboy Tiny Copy House and and hid in the house for so three months. They signed months. you. They didn't know you had a warrant. Out nah, there. they. I didn't have a warrant. But somebody that I was on a, that I was involved in something with was in jail for the crime, and I knew the police was looking for me. Okay. He didn't tell on me, but they didn't put the warrant out so that they wouldn't alert me. But I knew what was going on. Right. You know. So I just was like, I'm gonna sign my deal to get this check and fight my case. Hmm. Truthfully, you know. And you know, by the grace of God, I got out of that situation. I ended up doing a probation violation. I, I signed my deal to Epic. We went to Jamaica to celebrate. We came back. And the police was at my store waiting for me the next day and took me to jail. Why, because you didn't get permission to leave the country? Nah, not even that. It just was that I guess they heard I was back. Mm. You know what I mean? I guess they heard I was back in town. And I figured when I came back from Jamaica that I didn't have no warrant. Because mm -hmm. I came back over the you know, country lines and they didn't arrest me at the border. So I'm like, oh, I ain't That's how you take your warrant. If I make it back, you know, I got a warrant. <laughs> really, I'm like, I'm going to get my deal and I'm going to deal with this shit afterwards. I'm it's gonna easier ways to check if you got warrants. <laughs> <laughs> I, I call lawyers, they're like, I don't see nothing. So yeah. I'm like, all right, we're going to see. Mm -hmm. But I was a little bit more confident. I didn't even come out the house till I got my deal. I sat in the house for like three months just to secure my deal. Mm -hmm. Cause I figured if I went to jail and it was a real case, that's gonna be the end of my opportunity. Right. So I did my deal and uh, as soon as I came back, I went to jail. And I fought my case for like two months in the county, got out and I just came to New York and just start recording what became the Bullets Ain't Got No Names mixtapes. Mm -hmm. So I said all I had to say. And so you had a deal before the Bullets Ain't Got No Name mixtapes? At, after volume one, I got my deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So volume two, that was the one that Epic Records helped promote gotcha. with Hustle in the House, and then we was like had a video on MTV, and we kind of took a incline, you know what I mean, and like uh, uh, fan awareness, I guess, or just people understanding who he was. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, I was under pressure when I took that deal. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't, I don't know what I would have done, but my goal was to stay indie mm. and just, you know, like I said, try to sell fifty thousand. I had a map on my wall, <laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna sell a thousand units in each market. You know what I mean? And be able to sell 50,000 units. And when that didn't happen, I took my deal. I was I was sincere about mm -hmm. working with Epic. I wasn't like, I'm gonna use these people. No, right. I, wasn't, I wasn't looking at it like that. I'm like, this is how the cookie crumbled, I'm gonna go this route. But um, it was a regime change up there. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Walk signed me when Brandon Creed and um, a dude named Adam Granite was in that building. And then also Johnny Shipes. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a team of people, and then Jim McDaniels also, that was, you know, they believed in me. They had power in that building. And then when they left, it was a whole new cast that came in. And I mean, I'm sure y'all know what happened when, when the yeah. regime change happened at the label. Right. You know, you don't really get credit for what's already signed. And it's, it's in your interest to bring new talent to the to the building. So they ain't dropped me, but I just had a, I had a convo with the general manager. I'm like, bro, 
I know how to get it out the trunk. You know what I mean? I appreciate what we've done. Let's work for another year. And if we can't get the album out, just let me go back and don't hold my career up. Let me let me go back indie. You you compare yourself to Down South Pioneers on the album a lot. Percy Miller, James Prince, Brian Williams. What about them inspired you so much? Um, just I, I could relate to where they where I saw they they origin mm -hmm. and where where I saw the intention for them to go into music. I felt like that's that's what happened with me. Like I was knee deep in some shit, and I always had a passion for music. I was always a creative person. I really wanted to do music first before I got into the streets. Mm -hmm. And I was frustrated because I, I ain't had no studios. It wasn't no infrastructure on the West Coast. And it was like, it was it was pressure from outside. You know what I mean? And uh, after a while, I stopped resisting it. But I always wanted to do music. So when I looked at people like, you know, Birdman, people like um, his brother, not just Bird, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a team effort. Um, you know, Jay Prince and rap a lot. Uh, E-40 and Sick With It Records, I didn't mention him on the album, but that's another one. Jay-Z, Biggs, mm -hmm. Dame. Um, everybody that was indie and that, that came out of the streets into the independent grind and then graduated that into being commercially successful, I, I could trace their steps. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know how this person that who uncle was in the game, mm -hmm. I didn't have that access or who, you know, um, just had a relationship with a platinum artist. And no, that's no disrespect to nobody, but that wasn't my reality. I was and, like, go ahead. And, and how did you link up with Atlantic? Cause now you and Atlantic have a partnership. Yeah. What made you do that partnership? Um, we, we had been talking for a while. Once I got out of the Epic situation, I started doing the marathon mixtapes and touring. You said a while, that must've been like two, three years, four years. Yeah, no, nah, nah, for sure like two or three years. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, I had a certain terms that I wanted to come into the building with. Mm -hmm. And so I met with Craig probably like 012, 013. And uh, at the time, you know, they didn't feel like I could justify my terms, which mm -hmm. was probably true, you know? So I kept working. We did the Crenshaw tape. And then at that point, we got back in, in, in the table. I mean, we sat back down at the table and, you know, we figured out what, what the deal structure would be. And, uh, you know, I did a couple more mixtapes and then we actually inked the deal. And, uh, you know, deliver the album. Did you keep that deal quiet because you wanted to keep giving the illusion of independence? No, nah, it, wasn't, it wasn't the illusion of independence. It was just, I had made the mistake prior to announcing the deal. And I realized people don't care about a deal. That's nah. a business thing. Right, people right, care right. about music. <laughs> right, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So I, and what happens is that when you announce a deal, it's like a press uh, window. You get like 30 days of, of press. They write about you and mm -hmm. I wanted that to roll into the album. The album, got you. So I didn't want to make no announcement until the album was turned in. We had a release date. So the announcement, which came December 1st of 2017, right. was the first piece of content. It, it came out with a single and with a video. And from then we, we was, you know, piece content, 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 content up until February 16th was the album release. Very strategic. I love the planning behind Thank everything. Thank you. You talk about West Coast infrastructure. It was a period when you needed a Dr. Dre co-sign to get out of the West. Why, why do you think that changed? Um, I mean, you could always use a Dr. Dre co-sign, yeah. but just what you said, Dre, man, he built, um, uh, I call it an island. Mm -hmm. If you look at music, it's like three or four islands in, in rap music. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And a lot of the, a lot of the things that you might not know, well, y'all know, but that the people might not know are connected to these islands, they connected. You mm -hmm. got the like Jimmy Iovine, Dr. Dre Island, which you gotta list all the artists. Tupac came under that. Mm -hmm. Dre, Snoop, Game. Um, Kendrick. Well, yeah, Kendrick is a part of the top dog thing as well, but mm -hmm. it connects, you know what I'm saying? And so then you got like the Lior, Def Jam Island and that, not Island Records, I'm just saying Island. Yeah, island. Yeah, yeah, island. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and you know, a lot of uh, Rough Riders, Murder Inc., yeah, Rockefeller, DMX, yeah. yeah, you know, um, Kanye and all the artists that came out to Ye uh, fall under that. And then you got, um, what's the other one? Whatever happened on Sony, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so, um, damn, I kind of lost train of thought about what you asked me. You was like the Dr. Dre yeah, thing. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so I feel like um, it was one of them three Options right. for an artist, and unless you you want to go, what I call just taking the stairs and, mm -hmm. and figuring out how to how to get into one of those situations as your own thing. Top Dog did it, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Top right. Dog created his own thing. Yeah. I remember them. We was all on the LAX tour together, and it was it was you know years and years and years, and you know they held out and, and established themselves as their own entity. 
And so that was my goal to build an island myself. You know what I mean? I mm -hmm. saw what, even like Jay, they got Rock Nation. That's an island. Right, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's its own thing. Even though it came from them being an artist connected to another situation, they have turned that into its own operation. So go ahead. No, no, good. And you mentioned also on the album that, you know, you don't do radio records. You right. Don't, you don't focus on, I got to find a record for radio. Right. And you've done that from the beginning of your career. Now it doesn't matter. But back then, everybody wanted the radio record and every label was looking for that radio record. Does a label now look for that? Because with all their signees, I can't think of most people that don't have a record that they push on radio. I think that it's two ways to go about it. And I think you could be an album artist that, you know, you focus on your product is the album. Mm-hmm. Or you could be a, a single-driven artist or try to find a balance between both. But I think, like, you look at Beyonce, at the beginning of her career, it was all hits. It was all singles. Mm -hmm. But then at a point, it was like the focus became the album. And it was like, you know what I'm saying? It was just how to make the album an event. And then whatever the people chose, mm -hmm. that will be the record that, you know, everybody got behind and you supported with your visuals and everything. But I would never say that we, we intentionally avoid trying to, end up on the radio, mm -hmm. but just, you know, from where I was standing and what the message was and what the story was, uh, I tried making radio records in the past and it ain't feel authentic. And, and you don't really need it. Yeah, I mean, the game, so it, it's a different game right now. I think it's a lot about streaming. It's about making a dope product that people really want to hear right. over and over again. But you always could, radio gonna give you that next level torn. So I wouldn't, when I said that, I was like, I ain't need radio to do mine. I done fine. Mm -hmm. I meant to get here. Right. You know what I mean? We go, we want to keep going, obviously, and, and penetrate the boundaries we haven't penetrated. But to this point, I just was speaking to how we was gorillas with the tactic. Gotcha. What kind of conversations did you and Diddy have? Because you and Diddy yeah. formed a relationship. I assume through... Lauren London and Cassie. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Bug threw me the alley-oop, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you have trouble with Lauren? No, I'm saying yeah. Lauren. Lauren introduced me to Puff. Oh, got you. Got I mean, you. I knew Puff, but it was it was more of a personal relationship. After you know, mm -hmm. uh, we was at Cassie's birthday, and stuff. something like that. You well, know, what made you want to get an old nigga like Diddy and put him on young nigga? That's, <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> nah, Diddy Diddy chose young nigga. I try to get him more rap niggas mm -hmm. because oh, okay. I was I was referencing the Hate Me Now video mm -hmm. and what 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 his his presence on that record with Nas brought right. to it. I'm like, look, this this the record, this rap niggas. I want you to get on this, put the mink on, get in the video, we gonna make a movie. And he was like, um, he told me the whole story behind that. He like, bro, I bust a forty million dollar check a week before I did that movie. So I went, I mean, that video. Wow. So he like, that's that's the energy you saw in that video. Wow. Like I went and spent all this dough on the chain, and we got tigers. He like, cause I got the <laughs> biggest check of my life. Yeah. So he like, we probably ain't gonna be able to recreate that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But. You know, um, when I played the rest of the songs for him, he heard Young Niggas and he chose that record. Really? Yeah, so, you know, he just went in the booth and then started, you take know. Take that, take that. Yeah, start gassing, <laughs> right. you know. But even still, like, Rap Niggas, he gave me some real production advice on that record. When I played it for him, it was different than what y'all heard. He said it wasn't loud enough. Right? Yeah, and he was like, listen, bro, he pulled up Natural Born Killers by Ice Cube and Dr. Dre. Mm. He's like, this what you going for. This is what y'all trying to do on this record. Maximize it, make it sound like this. And we went back in the studio and I played it for my producers and then we turned it up and added a synth lead all the way through so it sound more like West Coast violent, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, I felt what he said after the fact. I was a little upset, like, what you mean? This shit banging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but after I reapproached it, it, it was room to make the record better. See, and that's for all those people who say Diddy don't do shit. Like when they say he don't really produce. Nah, but see me, <laughs> my understanding of Diddy, that's how I look at Diddy, mm -hmm. right? All right, think about more money, more problems. Mm -hmm. No disrespect to Big. Big is a legend. So what I'm about to say is not a shot against Biggie. Don't Please don't spin it like that mm -hmm. when they hear this. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that, all right, I seen an interview when Biggie had the glasses on, and he was like, yeah, it's more money, more problems. You know what I mean? You got to, you just, it come with this shit. That was before the record. Right. Mm. So who, who, who told the songwriter, hey, look, take the Diana Ross melody and take this line, more money, more problems and in the hook with more money, more problems. And who told, who who said that? Puff? That was Puff. Right. Right. That's production. Right. And Big and then presented it to Biggie. And who said sample the Diana Ross, I'm coming out record? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Who said that? That was Puff's decision. Mm -hmm. And then threw Biggie to Alley Oop and Biggie came with the B I G P O. That's classic. Yeah. Right. But to catch that Alley Oop, I've been an artist. I know what that do. I gotta right. when I think, I think about 
then we should sample a big record. Then I think about what, what can I tell the songwriter for the hook. Then I gotta also do the verse. Mm -hmm. So that's what I told Puff, bro, throw me some alley-oops. Like you do, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, listen to what I'm saying in my interviews, learn me, get in your Puff Daddy the producer bag and throw me some alley-oops, I'ma catch him. Mm -hmm. And that was like the, the original combo we had, you know what I'm saying? You sampled a uh, Hard Knock Life on the album. Yeah, yeah. Did you have to clear, who did you have to clear that with? Jay-Z. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. You know what's crazy about that record? I thought you played the keys over just enough where you had to clear it. Nah, That's listen. That's Hustle Hard Motivation record. Yeah, Hustle and Motivation. Hustle Motivate, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so when Jay cleared, and this is what I learned when we was going through the process of the paperwork. When Jay-Z got Annie to clear the record, I guess when he paid him, he said, y'all got to let every other rap artist after me use this. Wow. Really? Yeah. So that was his that was his deal with 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 uh whoever the producers and writers. That's that. interesting. You know what I'm saying? That's dope. Yeah, so we benefited off his negotiation in 1998. Wow. We just, we just had to get Jay Z to clear, because when he cleared it with the owners of the copyright, he made it to where any hip hop artist after him could use the record. Jay did that, so hopefully you don't have to go through that. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So everybody every hip hop artist got to clear with Jay first. Well, they, they, just, they just need, excuse me, they just need the Jay-Z clearance. The Annie clearance is good as long as they're a hip-hop artist. Jay's always showed you love, wow. though. Didn't he buy like a thousand copies of your Crenshaw album? What, what he, album was the thousand dollars? Bought, he copies? bought a hundred copies of Crenshaw that was a hundred dollars. hundred dollars, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. And now you didn't even know him back then, eh? Nah, I mean, you know, I met Jay in L.A. years ago at a concert. I was just backstage and I, you know, I ran up to, I ain't run up to him, just like, what's up, I'm Nip, you know what I mean? I'm from L.A., bro, from Rolling 60s. He actually bought a lowrider. The story is, I ain't never asked him, but he bought a lowrider from one of my homeboys, Money Mike. Mm -hmm. That's in the Maya video. That uh, that um, best the, of me. The baby blue one, right? Yeah, you know what I mean? He bought that from one of my homeboys, one of my G homies from LA. That was an old school hustler. That was mm -hmm. really his, huh? Yeah, that was his, he bought that. I'm tired of that nigga being so real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's confirmed, you know what I mean? Wow. Mm -hmm. Nah, but, so, I just was like, yeah, I'm, I'm Nip, I'm from Rolling 60s. He like, nah, I know. And you know, this was years before the, the Crenshaw thing. He like, you know, y'all you doing your thing, keep keep going. So that was the only combo we ever had until the Crenshaw thing. But um, yeah, Jay been a hundred, man. Jay, right. Jay just been, you know what I mean? Just always speak highly, always, you know what I mean? Tip his hat, so you know what I mean? Dope. A lot of love. I had no idea that money gets mildewy when you, I saw you tell me that story. I didn't either. We learned the hard way. We yeah, learned that the hard way. you put it in the safe or you had it on the mattress? We had it in the safe, wrapped in plastic. Same thing happened to me. They yeah. said baking soda, you put baking soda in oh, the Oh, to keep it from um, um, mildewing? It happened to me too. But Damn, you buried it um, in the back, your brother buried it in the backyard. Yeah, That's yeah. hard. How much was it? He buried a quarter mil and came, when we dug it up, but it was like a, more than a hundred was like just stuck together. Imagine stacks of money. And you feel wet. Yeah, and you mm -hmm. can't peel it. It's just one lump of, of paper. Happened to me too. Yeah. And then the color faded. It got holes in it. We was so like good borderline advice nervous breakdown. Do not bury money in the backyard. Well, nah, What's airtight, wrong? fireproof, safe. Don't believe the hype. Yeah, yeah, What's no, wrong bad. with bank accounts, guys? <laughs> like, <why? laughs> I mean, back then, you know what I'm saying? You want to access, you know, we might need it at three in the morning. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. You might have to get low. <laughs> now, blue lace is too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what happened with the money? Is it, is, was it gone? It, it was ruined. You can't use it. Gone. About 100 of it was, was, I mean, I swear to God, I cried. on my, my no, I, <laughs> I was trying to hold it down for my brother because I was actually his money. Mm -hmm. But my mom, my little sister, she was probably like 10 at the time. We was all in the living room with the blow dryer. You know, it was it was futile. We wasn't what getting none of do? it back, but we was just trying to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember going to the Sloss and Swap meet with that money. Because my brother like, just, you can have it, bro. I'm, fuck it. But you using it? Could you use it? I tried. I went to Ben Baller. And I went to his. <laughs> ben Baller? Yes, he got, a, he got a booth at the Sloss and Swap meet. Right. And I went to his cousin, Steve, and all of his people. And I'm like, shit, you know, some of this shit can spend, bro. What can we do? And they, they let me spend a little bit of it. But oh, that's nice. Yeah, that why, shit was devastating. Why not just launder the money instead of burying it? Well, we don't, we don't, we don't launder money. We don't launder money. You know what I'm saying? That's, some, that's illegal, Charlamagne. You know what I'm saying? Jeez. We pay the IRS, man. Now, now, now Blue Lace is two. One mm -hmm. of my favorite records on the album. You make a spook who sat by the door reference. You know about that, man. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I read yeah. that book. But I don't, I don't think you a spook who sat by the door. I think your intentions are pretty clear. Well, now I, I would say so. But even to the, to the point we made earlier, mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons I was so vocal about where I was coming from and, and what I represented because right. I I knew, I knew who I wanted to mobilize, you know what I mean? And I'm gonna name my last album that spooked to sat by the door. Mm. You know what I mean? When I when I finished my my situation with uh with our partnership at Atlantic. And uh for anybody that ain't seen that book, I mean seen that movie or read the book, it's about a gang member from Chicago who uh 
you know, um, presented himself in a way he never caught no cases. He was he was he had a clean cut look, and he infiltrated the CIA. Yep. And he became educated and became and basically he used their agenda, which was to have a token nigga in the CIA for political reasons. You know, we gonna speak right. blunt. Fuck it. Mm -hmm. Um, he used it against them. And I think that in terms of hip hop, you think of the message that they embrace. I feel parallel with like you know what I mean the 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 power structure. I don't mean the culture of hip hop, but the power structure of music. They got prescribed personas they expect from us. You know what I'm saying. So I feel like the way he used their intention against him was was one of my underlying strategies. You yeah, know, what you got saying? you got to put the medicine in the candy. 100%. And what's interesting about that book? All his people used to call him an Uncle Tom and a coon. You know what I'm saying? Sellout. Yeah. But he was there working for them the whole time. Yeah, and, and he and he. I don't want to go blow nothing up like he did in the movie. You know what I mean? But just in terms of being able to mobilize his 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 homies to a to a higher cause. You know, that's yeah. something I, I feel like we all got to do. Me me and Kendrick and Top and Snoop. Kendrick talk about it in dedication. Mm -hmm. We had a convo at the at the park premiere, just about you know a little bit of what we talking about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's a lot of little jewels that you saying, and then that's what I like. Like I said, the medicine really is in the candy because even when you drop a ball like about Dr. Sebi, yeah, like just that one thing they killed Dr. Sebi will make somebody go research who, who Dr. Sebi is. Hundred percent, Dr. Dr. Sebi. I thought it was yeah. Sebi. CB. 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 My bad, I said it wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm an LA nigga, man. Too. My lingo a little different. Have you met right? Dr. Sebi? I never met him. I met his wife, and I, I take his products for sure. Now the coolest guy ever. I mean, he was uh, when we interviewed him. I think he was about seventy four. Oh y'all interviewed him? Yeah, we interviewed him twice. Damn. Not here, but when I was on the other show, he was able to jump from the floor up here on his knees. At, at seventy something. On his knees yeah. and jump back down, and no problems, nothing like that. Why? Why you think they he killed had, him? Why do they kill all holistic doctors? Messing up the medical industry. You, play, you short stopping that grind. Why do niggas get killed for hustling in front of a nigga spot? You short stopping the grind. And th these niggas, they check is billions. Mm -hmm. You got niggas that get flipped for a couple hundred thousand. So you playing with some pharmaceutical money, you know? And what's crazy, I'm, I'm working on doing a documentary on the trial of, in 1985 when Dr. Sebi went to trial against New York. Right. Because he he put a newspaper, he cured AIDS. Yeah. Did he? Did he? Beat he beat the case, case. Yeah. and he went to federal court the next day and beat that case yeah. on record. Yep. And nobody talk about it. That's crazy. I'm in the middle of doing this holistic detox right now, day six of fourteen. Yeah, you was telling me. Yeah. So. No food, nothing. And they said it actually can help cure fibroids. It can um, help you if you are, you know, cancer, any right. type of heart issues, and it's all natural herbs and all organic and. All holistic, yeah. without actually going to a doctor and getting exactly, you know, pharmaceutical. Yeah, you, how you feel though? You feel you feel. I a actually difference? feel pretty good. Do you feel a difference? You think? I do. That's it right. could be also because I've cut a lot of things out and I haven't had any food, nothing solid at all right. in the past six days. But I feel all right, better right. than I thought. No question. Now, what happened with Reebok? And and, and were, were you signed to Reebok? Did the Reebok do the release that you were there? Nah, I did. I did an endorsement with Puma right recently. Um. I don't want to go too deep into that because I had to check your footwear when you said it. I was like, "Yeah, we yeah, got them on." Yeah, come on, man. Okay, I ain't, I ain't, fall, I ain't uh, <laughs> faking. Mm -hmm. Nah, but I don't want to go f too far in the details with the with the other thing because it's something that we gonna pursue. But um, you know, it wasn't authorized. Mm -hmm. It wasn't authorized, and they they put all money in on the shoe. They put Rich Rolling on the shoe. I don't even. That's that's some gang shit. You don't put Rich Rolling on no shoe. You know, you gotta pay. Thousands of people. This nigga's doing life in jail. That you know what I mean. Fall under that structure. So you gotta be careful with that. You know. Yeah. Even, I don't. I'm not even taking a check for nothing to say. Rich Rolling. Mm -hmm. I would have told him. I'd have told the designers. No, bro. Stay clear of that. You can't copyright. That's like putting Crip on a shoe or something. Who you gonna pay? And that causes problems for you because niggas like, oh, you got paid off. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And not even outside of that, because if 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 I was right, I would I would stand on being right. That's not right. Mm -hmm. I'm not the I'm not the beneficiary of that. You can't just pay me and think that. And they, by the way, they didn't pay me, but you can't just pay me and think that. Oh, we we paid Nip and he they speak for the Nah, bro. These niggas they, that, pass, right? they got they got a hundred years. Niggas right. gotta you know buy soups. You know what I'm saying? What I look like taking a a check? I can't do that. Hmm. Now, now grinding all my life, you tell a story where somebody got stomped out, and you say Fifty and Mayweather. Bounced with y'all in Vegas. What was yeah. that? <laughs> that was a long time ago, man, at a club. Me and YG was performing at in Vegas called Strip Hop. And, uh, you know, somebody, a melee broke out. And, uh, you know, it ain't going their favor. 
the, the niggas that started it. Mm -hmm. And uh, just so happened 50 and, and, and Mayweather was in the club. You know, they had all the cars and shit. They was really just coming to show love. And, uh, you know, it, it made the news. It was a big old thing, but niggas tried to rob us. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, somebody was waiting outside of my section. It was all girls coming into the section to take pictures. And, you know, you be in the section, your chain hang. You right. be standing on the couch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody was like, where you from? One of the niggas, I'm thinking you're a fan. I'm like, huh, you at my concert? You don't know where I'm from. I'm from LA, bro. He's like, no, where you from? And I frowned. I guess my homeboy seen me frowning, dope fiending. And then it just, a, 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 big old, a big old melee broke out. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, that's what that was about. It's I, on YouTube. The, the the news footage is on YouTube. Right. But why yeah. 50 and Mayweather had to bounce with y'all? Like they needed they needed to get out the club. Or? Well, you that was probably it, taken out of context. Oh, gotcha. They left the same time. Oh, you know right. what I'm so saying? They, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Floyd was there with 20, 30 security, and 50 was there with with 50, 30 people. So I'm yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. That was good money. I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I wasn't saying like they needed our help. It's just like you know, uh, a little fact they was in the building, and you know they got footage of Floyd on on the internet arguing with the police mm. in the front of the club. You know, I just I be trying to revolve around real shit that took place. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Right. Just to go back to the Dr. Sebi thing real quick. What makes you want to do a CB. documentary? Doc okay, CB. get it right, man. What makes you want to do a documentary about Dr. CB? Um, I think the story is important. I think mm -hmm. it's a powerful narrative. It is. You know what I mean? And I think if imagine this, anybody in this room, if I could say, hey, somebody cured AIDS, y'all be like, yeah, right. And then I could show you a, a example of him going to trial and proving in a court to a jury that he cured AIDS. Y'all would be interested in that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And y'all would look into the way he did it, right? So I feel like more so than like championing his products or explaining his methodology, put some light on that case. Imagine being able to cure cancer or being able to cure any type of herpes, just yeah. all kinds of And that's what things. he do, by no, the that's way. That's what he did. He yeah. Had, yeah, he, yeah, he used to send all types of, of vitamins up to the station. Uh, you had herpes? No. I said vitamins <laughs> to the station. <laughs> did you hear me? I said vitamins Not anymore, to the he station. Damn, heavy. This, <laughs> this guy is crazy. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to ask, what, what happened with um with Cardi B? People were, were mad uh, what you said about Cardi B. I, I guess that nah, she but, wasn't a, a, a real... No, nah, that's not what I said. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? Just for, she's a woman. Yeah, I, I like real. Cardi B. Right. Cardi B did a verse for me. You mm -hmm. started it off saying, I like yeah, Cardi that's, B. Yeah, that's, that's a fact. Like, I, anybody don't like Cardi, they a hater. I, I used to watch her IG clips and be laughing like, this girl crazy, but right. her personality is golden. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But wrong is wrong, right is right, bro. That's what I grew up on. Mm -hmm. Niggas that love me, bro, gonna tell me, bro, you was wrong. Right. All right, don't tell me that in public. Wait till we get back to the hood. I might set off a melee, and we niggas gonna fight with me. But when we get back to the hood, bro, that was bullshit. Don't do that. You gonna have us. You gonna get us in a wreck. Wrong yeah. is wrong, right is right. Cause that terminology she used is like real. And look, let me just for the record. That's how bloods talk. Mm -hmm. Bloods say crap. Bloods say flu. Crips say slob. Crips say dead. Like if I was with all my homeboys, I'd be like, bro, give me a dead bull. That's how we talk. Mm -hmm. But. I be intentionally respectful on the record because we talking about a public environment, which is the music industry. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? We saw what happened with Death Row. Mm -hmm. So we gonna set trip in public? Y'all gonna get caught on camera squabbling. Mm -hmm. You gonna violate why you worth 300 million, Suge Knight? Mm. You gonna go to the pen. Pac, you gonna die. Right or wrong, that happened. That was gang banging, that was set tripping publicly. So we would be bad leaders to re 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 create that. What about somebody like Takashi 69? I don't want to talk about other people for real, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I I feel I feel my own way about it, but God bless everybody, man. Get your money. You mm -hmm. feel me? I, what I said about Cardi, big asked me, and so I spoke on it, but I don't want to hate on Cardi B. Get mm -hmm. your money, Cardi. I respect what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I, she done a verse for me. I see the Migos, I shake their hand. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I respect her come up. She came from the gutter. About saying disrespectful things on uh, on IG, mm -hmm. I'm going to always be like, that ain't the move. That's not that's not what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Now, do I tell you what to do? Nah. You get it how you live. If you like it, I love it. Mm -hmm. I just know me and mine, we're going to move this way because I'm going to always stand on what I do. So that if I walk into a room full of bloods and I ain't going to be like, oh, they go to slobs, I'm not finna talk like that. Mm -hmm. Cause that's that's called being a cell soldier on some jail shit. You know what I'm saying? What's a cell soldier? A nigga that's in the cell popping it. 
Gotcha, because gotcha. you can't get touched. You hiding behind the the the, the cell. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Pop the gates. Talk like that. Mm-hmm. If you ain't gonna talk like that, then keep it one way. I've been in a, a tank with a hundred bloods before. I'm from six oh crib. I ain't finna call niggas slobs. Niggas will kill me. But I ain't finna I'm this is where I'm from, homie. You feel what I'm saying? And so same the other way around. I, I've been in a, a dorm with a hundred crips and two or three bloods. And niggas ain't using that terminology. They not. That's just against the laws of nature. This is self-preservation gonna prevent you from talking like that. That's what I was speaking on. Mm-hmm. But for the record, and just for the New York bangers, I respect real niggas everywhere. It's real niggas everywhere mm-hmm. in every city and state. I, you can't take that from nobody. Gang culture came from out of LA. That don't mean it ain't real niggas in New York mm-hmm. that pushing a, a, a line as bloods and crips. But we gotta be honest, we gotta speak honestly. We can't be political about shit that niggas dead and doing life for. Mm-hmm. You feel what I'm saying? Absolutely. That, so that's 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 my stance on it. But so like I said, everybody get money, man. I respect Cardi. You know what I mean? She linked up with, with Wacko, one of my, a, a, a nigga I respect, he a Paro. And you know, I ain't mad at her, do your thing. I just, my personal opinion, it's in your interest not to be public dissing gangs. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Unless you want to put your security at risk, because it ain't going to be you shooting or getting shot at. You're going to be pushed into the car. You know, we, we were talking about uh, on Friday last week, we were talking about checking in. And and how do you feel about checking in? Because, I mean, it's it's a big thing, especially in L.A., you know what I mean? Because it's so open. And, you mean, you could drive in a block in L.A. In one block, it'd be a sunny, clean block. Next block, you in the middle of the hood. 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Checking in is... it it, it suggests friendly extortion mm-hmm. when you say checking in. A relationship is different because we all need relationships. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure when you travel, you from New York, mm-hmm. but you got relationships all over the country. Charlotte, man, you got relationships all over you. Angela, I'm sure you do too. And a relationship, I don't, I don't believe in fake relationships. Mm-hmm. So it just establish genuine relationships everywhere you go. You'll be in a better position. And you do that off being respectful mm-hmm. and being, you know, you reciprocated. Somebody come to your city, bro, you need something. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a car, some weed, you know what I mean? You want to go somewhere to eat, what you need. You out of town, I got you. Mm-hmm. Not just some protection, you feel me? So I I, I wouldn't say a, the check-in. I don't know nothing about that. But just I got relationships in New York mm-hmm. that it's respect. When I pull up, you know what I mean? Niggas will make sure I got whatever I need. Same in L.A. I can get you from the airport, bro. You can take my car. You could come to my store. You could you meet my homeboys. You could get niggas numbers if you any problems or whatever. Just call in or you want to know where to go eat at. That ain't because you had to. That's because it's respect. Yeah, respect. we yeah. it's strength in numbers, and we only from one place. Right. You know. On on dedication, you say you want real nigga reparations. What's your what's your idea of real nigga reparations? Access, man. You know what I'm saying? Like we we boxed out. Even like Angela was saying earlier about like cryptocurrency and technology. It, we gotta we gotta we underrepresented in, in technology. Mm-hmm. I just opened a um um a co-work space in, in my neighborhood called Vector 90. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we did our grand opening, Don Peebles, who's a billionaire real estate investor, came down and he's on the board with us. And you know, he spoke and you know, my partner David Gross, who whose idea was originally, he put facts about the wealth inequality on the wall as like the aesthetic of the building. And you look at Facebook, you look at Google, you look at all of these billion dollar, multi-billion dollar technology companies mm-hmm. and look at their demographic. It was like a bar chart, white, Asian, you know, black. Mm-hmm. It was like less than, the highest one I seen, I think was Facebook with like 9% mm. black people working in that country. How many of us got Facebook? All of us. All of us. How many how many artists who got hundreds of millions of followers are black? And you know, they 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 leverage their value off the amount of people mm-hmm. and eyeballs. So it's that's what I mean when I say in right now at this moment, you know what I mean? That's what that, that would be what that term represent. Like we want access, you know what I mean? We should be included. And not only shouldn't nobody let us, it shouldn't be affirmative action. We should be educating and ourselves and being actively pursuing that yeah knowledge. you know what i'm saying and also be aggressive with saying bro don't play with me with your with the way you position your yo your, your business model mm-hmm. we aware don't play with me homie i'm gonna be disrespected like you spit in my face it's actually more disrespectful 
than spitting in my face. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's what I meant by that. Now, everybody on Bitcoin now, you mentioned it a couple of times already, but you've been on side, uh, cryptocurrency. Like you know, what's crazy, y'all remember um, I got into it with Complex a while ago, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I I got upset because they put me on an underachiever list. You mm -hmm. said Mark Echo, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a meeting, Karen Civil set up a meeting with Mark Echo because he owned Complex. And so I, I went up there, and they um <laughs> we had a long convo, and after we got everything out the way, we just started uh, popping it to each other mm -hmm. and he was like you know I was telling him about my concept for the Marathon store I'm like I want to have 10 stores in America I want to have a retail network like Apple mm -hmm. I could drive my albums in my own stores I could control the aesthetic and the environment I could surround niggas with products he's like yeah that's cool but look into e-commerce he basically shitted on the whole <laughs> idea like fuck a store he right. like, it's a lot of overhead yeah it's, you, you know everything's shifting toward e-commerce and he was like look into Bitcoin I was like oh 13 wow so after that, I start researching and just doing my education on it. And, uh, you know, I invested late into Bitcoin, but I was aware of it for a long time. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, since then, I've invested into a company called FollowCoin, which is a cryptocurrency mm -hmm. application, and another one called Vest. So, um, you know, we, we in the space. Now, now, what happened with the LGBT community? They, they were set tripping on you at one point when you... <laughs> you know, man, they, for the record, come on, man, I'm, I live in L.A. I'm in the music industry. You gonna, I, I there's no way I could have take issue with anybody's sexuality. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And at the end of the day, I got people in my family. I got people I love, mm -hmm. my homegirls, some of the, you know, people that I grew up around that, you know, that's their lifestyle. I could never judge nobody for, for their sexuality. What they, what they took out of context was a critique on the media. I made a critique on the media and I was really speaking toward what my homeboy Big U did for the kids mm -hmm. and the image of, you know, somebody that came from prison, that came from gang culture, what 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 the image gets portrayed as around that type of individual and what this 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 person's actually doing. And, you know, I think that it was taken out of context. Um, you know, and that's a that's a sensitive thing. I would never want people to feel alienated or like, damn, you know, an artist that I'm inspired by or look up to or somebody I respect might look at me as less than. That's not what I meant, you know what I'm saying? And I think it just got taken out of context. And you know, it's a movement right now for like acceptance and mm -hmm. equality. So, you know, there's a whole machine built behind, it's like a, like a witch hunt. You know what I'm saying? Let it like let anybody say oh, sexism, homophobia. It's a witch hunt. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So I fell into that. It's all good. You know what I mean? I respect it. I'm with the movement of equality and everybody respect everybody as individuals. God is the creator and the judge. I'm not the judge. I think they were just upset because they felt like you were implying that homosexuals couldn't look like so and, so called real men. And that was probably the error that that I made in, in articulation. That you know, it could be read like that. I could have been more clear. You know what I'm saying? But I, me personally, I judge things off of intention. We are human. We gon' we gonna make mistakes. But I gauge somebody's intention. Mm -hmm. What was you trying to say? You know what I'm saying? Right. And if the intention is clear, I give the the execution a little wiggle room. You know what I'm saying? Or the or the articulation. And I I, I asked everybody, look at my intention. You know what I'm saying? What was I trying to say? I was trying to big up my homeboy for creating a banquet for these young. Right kids from the hood that play football, got everybody suited and booted. I see niggas in there that was killers at one time mm -hmm. with suits on, you know, serving the kids food. And you know what I mean? I'm like, we gotta do this more often. I wanted to shed light on that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, now how, how, have, how have you explored your uh, Eritrean ancestry? Yeah, definitely, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> I'm making a movie about the summer of 2003. When I was 18, um, I went to Eritrea for three months out the blue, I didn't even know I was going. My brother just was like, bro, we about to go back home. And I had a spot at that time, I was hustling. I had a studio, I was like knee deep in some young nigga shit. Mm -hmm. I didn't really wanna go. Mm -hmm. And I went out there for three months and it changed my life. I was sick the first two weeks. I was like culture shock, depressed. I ain't understand, I ain't really have no way to, I ain't know what to do out there. Um, but after the first two weeks, I embraced what was going on. And I just kinda, it's like I had to let go of my my comfort, what made me comfortable, I was smoking weed every day, riding mm -hmm. around the hood in a car with rims, and I just had a different comfort zone. 
And once I got out of that, you know, it changed my life. And I, I you know, one thing that was that was unique about the culture back home is that everything built around food. So that's what make a family close is that you eat with your family. Mm -hmm. And I learned that from being out there. We move so fast out here in our culture that we might, what's up mom, boom and leave. Every, it might be seven, eight years. We eat at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And even then we running in for the meal, sit down and then we, we get back to the grind. Every day back home from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m., the whole city shut down. Everything but the restaurant. You know what I'm saying? And everybody going home, the men going home, the kids schools mm -hmm. let out and everybody eat lunch. That's dope. You so know? How, how does all the energy surrounding Black Panther affect you then? Because you see everybody with the dashikis on and the African garments and... I mean, you mean the fashion day? Or, yeah, or just, just... just in general, people having like this sense of pride in the I, motherland. Man, I think that's important. You know what I mean? How, how, if, you don't, if you don't connect to a country, it's a devastating thing. Mm -hmm. man, I ain't even understand that until I went. Mm -hmm. It's devastating if you, ain't, if you can't connect to a country. Cause we know we not from America for real. But some people might have never been to where they're from too. That was a me. Lot of people, right? That was me. I was raised under my mom understanding. And I don't mean her personally. I just mean her being a black American whose grandma, I mean, whose mom came from New Orleans, Louisiana. And a couple generations back, they was exposed to slavery and you know what I'm saying? So to have an understanding of like, wait, it's a whole thousand, thousand year tradition that we connect to. And I'm I'm fortunate because my dad was born over there. Mm -hmm. So I connect to it in one generation. So I met my grandmother and I seen her way of living. This is my dad's mom. Mm -hmm. It's not five generations removed. So I connected to it easy or easier maybe than somebody that do their ancestry and figure out where they from and then go visit it, but don't got nobody that really love them. That you could say, this is my immediate family. But you know, I think that that movie was powerful. I seen it on the day of my album release. I was right. doing a lot, but I made sure I went to go bought a ticket and seen it. Mm -hmm. And just the, the last line Michael B. Jordan said was was a powerful line. Oh, about the bondage, what? Uh, bury me in the ocean. You know what I'm saying? More people who knew uh, death was more was better than bondage. That's that's heavy. You know what I'm saying? That's heavy. And I thought that I even hit him. I'm like, man, that was a powerful line. That's one of the most powerful things I heard because I felt that viscerally being in the streets. Mm -hmm. I would rather die than go to jail for life. Mm. I remember feeling like that I'm a whole court. When we used to be on bullshit that might have us go away forever, I'd be like, don't get in this car with me, bro, if you ain't, I'm not going to jail for no shit like this. I'm a whole court because I would, it's, it's to me, you'd rather die. I talk to niggas that got life. You'd rather die, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I felt that, you know what I mean? I think that was a powerful movie. Yeah, Absolutely. when you came in here today, you said you haven't smoked in five months <clears throat> yeah. either. So what does that do for you? And when, do you feel like you could just give it up permanently? Um, I never want to say never because I get something out of smoking weed mm -hmm. sometime, but I think anything in excess turned into a, a liability. And even for me, like, you know, I got an intense promo uh, campaign. You know, I got to be on camera. I got to be on time. I got to I gotta be, you know, I got to be able to think sharp. Um, so, I, you know, I, when, when it comes to like going out to the public and, and representing my product, I don't want to be, and even in business, you know, you right. come in there smelling like weed. Whether they say it or not, they hold it against you. They think they got a little edge on you if they don't smoke. Even now in Cali, with, with being legal and everything? I mean, it ain't even the like, uh, you're a criminal thing. It's that I think quicker than you. Yeah, I'm more yeah, focused yeah, yeah, than you. Yeah. I got more discipline mm -hmm. than you. I got less of a need to be comfortable than Until you. Until you say, well, I have my own dispensary and my own stream. Yeah, so all of that. <laughs> nah, I, I, from far as growing it, selling it legally, mm -hmm. we, still, we still do that. But just me personally, I don't use no drugs. I might drink some wine, you know what I'm saying, right now, but I don't mean I haven't in the past. Right now, it's more important to be focused. Now, you said soda, too. When you came here, you said I stopped smoking weed and stopped soda. You was a soda fanatic? I was drinking lean. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I was pulling it, and I didn't know how unhealthy that shit was. And part People of, were dying. Yeah, and part of that also is the amount of soda you drink. You got to think if you wake up and drink a soda at 8 a.m. and you drink sodas the rest of the day, Bro, I'm a skinny nigga. I was had a pop belly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, that shit don't look right on a skinny nigga. <laughs> you know, but just overall, just feeling unhealthy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't like the way that feel. Your eyes, you, it, it show. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, um, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm off all of that shit. I'm gonna just focus on being healthy, working out, eating good as best I can. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Being focused. And then I seen my team. I, I had a convo with Puff about the weed. 
Cause you know what I mean? He like you look like you've been doing yoga, nigga. He was making a joke, you know what I'm saying? Like you got a glow, nigga. Right, right. I'm like, nah, I stopped smoking the weed. And then he like, why? And so I had a convo with him. I'm like, we leaders, we got a lot of people that follow us. So when we stop, a lot of my team stopped smoking. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? A lot of the people that look to me, you know, just be in the gym now and just be on a more focused uh, frequency. So, you know, again, I ain't on the anti-weed campaign. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's when you feel like you want to go do something violent, smoke you some weed. That's, that's, that's the team with though. There we go. Smoke the right strain of weed. Yeah, yeah. Some indigo. Or some marathon OG. Smoke yeah. some of that. You know what I'm saying? I got a couple more questions. You speak about being a leader on loaded bases with CeeLo. You say a couple niggas, I'm paraphrasing, but a couple niggas every generation that remind us of our strength and our, and our stolen greatness. Yeah. Expound on that line a little bit. Um, I said, um, see, it's a couple niggas every generation that wasn't supposed to make it out, but they decode the matrix. Mm -hmm. And when they get to speak, it's like a stolen language or it's like a coded language. Coded language. Reminds niggas of their strength and all the stolen oh, greatness. Goodness. Yeah, that's clear, right? I think it means, yeah. to me, it's like, you know, and I say this in the humblest way. I, don't, I ain't trying to big up my gangster or my hustler when I say this, but you know, it's-, it's Being black is the shit. Yeah, that it's too. It's a privilege to be black. That too. <laughs> and just even like coming from where we come from and the shit that, you know, we was involved in in the, just being a part of the 90s in the in the 2000s in South Central LA being active. I don't know too many people that made it. They they had gang enhancements, technology took over, they started putting cameras up everywhere, but our culture didn't adapt quick enough. Mm -hmm. So we were still raised on go down the street, hop out and shoot. Even though it's cameras everywhere, mm -hmm. even though they got cell phone towers. So we got we we was a victim to to the technology. So the fact that we here you know, I feel like, you know, it's it's one or two or three, maybe, hopefully more, every generation that somehow, you know, I, I think it's God, my personal opinion, that, you know, keep you protected through them situations while you learning what you really here for. But, you know. And, and constantly reminding us of who we are. A hundred percent. And being able to speak from a place of experience, but on a platform and on, you know, in a, from, a, from a, a, a place of success that I'm telling you people, man, I, I got I got real real niggas that be like, man, I almost shed a tear listening to this album, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, niggas doing life, niggas in jail. Like, man, you know what I'm saying? This shit is emotional listening to this shit because they know. You know what I'm saying? It might be music to somebody, but niggas I was in them cars with us and in them spots with us and really went through that shit. Again, in a humble way. I don't mean this on like I'm a super tough nigga. I just mean the the, the, the path that niggas took. Um, it, It's like, damn, you know, that's my homeboy, you right. know? I know him, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I know I know what it means for him to be right there, you know, so that's what the line speak to. And another great example is how you, on the West Coast, you guys are very supportive of each other. Yeah. Just seeing the relationships that you have with other artists. Yeah. I know you feel the love, because sometimes people from where they're from, they don't feel that love. That was something that we did consciously. And it ain't fake. Like, I really fuck with YG, I respect YG. Mm -hmm. I see y'all work a lot together. Yeah, and that, that ain't for the for the, Cameras, you know what I mean? I had four, five hour convos with YG. I was supposed to be there the night he got shot. I was at the studio the next couple of days chopping it with him. Um, you know what I'm saying? My mama and his mama know each other. You know, I fuck with uh, J305. I fuck with Dom Kennedy, you know what I mean? Um, and everybody else, G Malone, you know what I'm saying? Gang. Glasses, what up, bro? Yeah, you know what I mean? Schoolboy from Hoover. I got respect for Schoolboy, you know what I mean? Our, our hood's beef in a real way, mm -hmm. in a real way, on site. Killing the Hoovers in the neighborhood car. You feel me? But I, I got respect for Schoolboy. And I got, you know, one of the reasons is because I saw what happened with Death Row. You know what I'm saying? You can't mix that shit. You gotta, we gotta have some type of, it's like, it's like the county jail. We all in here, bro. Ain't no way around it. We gotta have some yeah. structure. It, in the county, it'll be times and, you know, you walk into a dorm and it'll be like, bro, you the enemy. You gotta fight, but we're not gonna jump you. We're gonna give you your head ups. That's structure, because if niggas getting jumped in this dorm, what you think gonna happen next door? To your homie that's surrounded by 15 of my homies. Niggas in here getting stabbed in this dorm, what's gonna happen next door? Everybody gonna be getting killed. So it's structure that prevents shit from going haywire, you know? Well, how so do you, you get that mentality? Conscious, so that means that you guys really had a conversation, like this yeah. is a conscious thing, we are gonna make sure we support each other. And, and not in those terms, but on like, look, we don't want to divide the fan base. We don't want all the Crips riding with Nip and all the Bloods riding with YG. Mm -hmm. We don't want everybody feeling like 
who they listen to is a reflection of their loyalty to their to they side. We want niggas to think and to know it's music. And the demonstration we, we make, um, you know, it's gonna impact the generation afterwards. Recently, it's an artist from, from LA named Greedo. He from Grape Street. Mm -hmm. It's an artist from LA named RJ. He from Athens Park. They had some internet back and forth. And it was looking like they was going, it was going to turn into some shit. They did a concert together, RJ versus Greedo. All the Grape Streets was on stage with Greedo. All the Athens Park Bloods was on stage with RJ. And niggas had their purple flags and their red flags. And I don't know, the whole city was like, this shit going to turn into a, a bloodbath. Niggas kept it music. Mm. And at the end, they did their song that they had together. And oh, I, that's great. I, I saluted that that's and I respected dope. that because I was in the cut watching. Like, so you was there? I, no, I was just on the internet oh, watching the like, back and know. forth. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and I was just like, I hope niggas don't let this shit spill out because that's going to impact everything in the wrong way. And they, you know, they did it like bosses and then turned that's it dope. into a, a concert, made money, put on a good show. It was some competitive energy, but at the end of it, they did their song together. And now it turned into a, a, a string of shows. So I think that it's so political that we got to be conscious and we gotta we gotta create you know some structure so that we can stay here Absolutely. well how do you get that mentality to translate to the street then like what y'all doing in the industry how do you get that to translate throughout the whole street people got choices right so you're gonna look at what this group of people did and what the the, the repercussions were and what the the, the 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 feedback was from doing this and you're gonna look at what this group of people did and look at the feedback you want to go to jail for life you want to get killed do what we was doing Right. You want to get you some money, level up, create brands, build your team, get your family, get your homies on. Follow what we doing. It's your choice. My, my, my last question for Nip, man, because mm -hmm. I'm riding in the car and I'm like, boy, Nip going to get in some shit for this. You said that your mistress is Creole. How do you get away with that? Man, it's music, man. Oh. <laughs> I said I said my wife is a C-note. I said this is life Creole. is a free throw. My, my wife is a C-note, but my mistress is Creole. You know that was a that was wet. number one. I recorded that before me before I had a girl for real. Oh, okay. Before I was in a All relationship. Right. That's that's the disclaimer. Right? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a fact though. I ain't just put, yeah, being I political. But then you. again, it's music, man. Like my girl's an actress. If she kiss a nigga on camera, what I'm gonna be mad? Nah, do your thing. This I love is, I love the fact you said your girl. So y'all back together. Y'all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We solid. Players right. fuck up too, man. Yeah. That's all I'm gonna say about <laughs> that. Right? That's, you know that's the reason I ask. Cause she don't play. Yeah, she no. don't run down on you. Oh uh, yeah, she me. ran down on, on Charlamagne. <laughs> you know, Charlamagne went hard. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, you Boogie, Charlamagne Boogie, Boogie, it. Boogie, Boogie, man. You know she know how to defend herself and stand up. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And you know, um, she from L.A. Mm -hmm. She grew up. Um, a lot of people might think she got a privileged background. She ain't got no privileged background. They she, think she's new, new in real life. That's what they yeah. think. She's from Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nunu, yeah. yeah. Nah, but she come from L.A., man, and you know what I mean. Um, she's solid, so. You know, I ain't even had to. She seen Charlemagne and zeroed in, but she. I, I told, I told her, I told her from jump though. I'm like, you gonna meet Charlemagne and like Charlemagne, respect Charlemagne. You know what I mean? Charlemagne known for being honest and and you know what I mean, ruffling feathers. But I know his stance, and I'm like, y'all got the similar mentality in terms of like, what's right. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, she she got a lot of love and respect for you, bro. She recommended a book to me, but I can't remember the name of it. I was gonna ask you. Yeah, what was it? And she said she recommended it to you too. Oh she... yeah, nah, this is a powerful book. It's called The Way of the Superior Man. The Way of the Superior. There you go. Yeah, she down, fucked right me up now. with that book too. I ain't gonna lie to you. That's a that's a book women should not give to their man unless they really secure in themselves. Mm. Because the message of that book is basically for powerful men how to deal with your power. Cause you know, you got options. You get power and money and fame. You could go crazy. Right. So it just, it just give you a, a unique perspective. You know what I'm saying? On the right way to do things. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Yeah, from, from, the, from the author perspective, you know? It's heavy though. Word. Well, yeah. we appreciate you joining us. Nipsey Hussle. Yeah, 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 right yeah. Now. Victory, Victory Lap. Yeah. And it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.